Hi, I'm Carlisle Hashem, and welcome to the Carlisle's Chesapeake Show. I have with us Leslie Cario here today. We're here in Easton, Maryland, and um, Leslie, you have a consulting business called Chesapeake Horticultural Services? Yes. Tell us what you do there. Well, I work as an independent consultant to nonprofits, nurseries, and landscape organizations, um, landscape operations and I have a focus on native plants and conservation landscaping. So you've worked with uh, the Master Gardeners and tell us some, about some of the other organizations. Um, well, I, I do a lot of work with Atkins Arboretum. We have some projects with um, propagating plants and working with their living collections database and um, I also work with them to source plants for their native plant sale that's held every spring and fall. And we have some of those native plant sales here that we're going to talk about in a minute. But first, uh, let's talk about the fact that we are so close to the Chesapeake Bay and how we would like for people to walk away today knowing that they can do something to help the bay. So um, could you tell us about conservation planting? Sure. Well, if you're interested in landscaping or gardening in a way that's bay-friendly or you know, doing conservation landscaping. You don't have to rip everything out and start from scratch. You can just start by integrating some practices that um, all add up in the long term. So, um, for example, working to conserve water on site or make sure that water leaving the site is clean, um, promoting healthy soils, providing wildlife habitat, and especially planting native plants. There are eight elements that you would like our listeners to uh, go to the website and talk, and if you could talk about those eight elements, please. Sure. Um, well, those I mentioned are four of the most um, important eight elements, and um, you can get the full information on the website of the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, and this is, this is the guide. You can download the eight elements for free or you can order a printed copy for just a few dollars and it outlines all, all of the elements there. And when, say I have bought a, um, a house and there's a garden there already, I don't know what's in the garden and perhaps it's best to wait and see what's going to come up first before I start <laughs> ripping up. <laughs> That's always a good idea. You, you will find all kinds of treasures probably and um, just get an idea of what's blooming as you go through the first season. So, um, so many of our native plants are providing benefit for pollinators and the best way that we can um, do this is to plant so that you have a variety of things blooming at different times throughout the year. And um, so, you know, if you already have a landscape in place and you want to supplement that with additional native species, then you look and see where you have windows of opportunity where, you know, maybe nothing is blooming and, and you want to add in. So we, are, we think beauty, you know, we think flowers, we think beauty, but I think we're beginning to think more, well, beauty comes not just from the flowers, but it comes from what is attracted to the flowers and how that increases our sensory <laughs> um, delight over the garden. Uh, so could you talk about what we might get back from planting a, a flower that might not be as pretty as you would be the first, that would be the first thing that you would uh, pick to be in your garden? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, with honeysuckles. They've been so widely planted and many of the species that we're used to seeing are, are not native, but there is a native honeysuckle, sometimes called coral honeysuckle, and it has a red bloom and it's something that um, will bloom quite profusely mm. from October through, or excuse me, April through June and then continue on at a slower pace through October. And it is just marvelous for attracting hummingbirds. There are butterflies that use this plant as well. And then when those flowers go to see the bright red berries that will be fed upon by birds. Oh, the nice. Season. So you could have, say, a trellis for some elevation in your garden with the honeysuckle there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is not going to be invasive to the rest of your garden? That's correct. 
That's great. Well, we have um, a couple plants here. If you could tell us about them, please. Sure. Um, this is just a sampling of the plant material um, that you would find at the native plant sale at Atkins Arboretum. And, and they're not dead, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. At this time of year, the plants are dormant. And so essentially they're taking a rest and as temperatures start to warm up in the spring, they'll break dormancy. But um, one of the things that is um, good for wildlife is to keep the vegetation from the previous year intact if it's planted in your landscape until you get into the later part of the spring. Um, so this, this is an ornamental grass and this is um, actually a flower, the soldaga, right? Right. And penistetum, um, no, not penistetum, paniculum. This, this is panicum brigatum, <laughs> the switchgrass. Yeah, and so both we, we leave the seed heads intact as long as possible so that animals can use this for cover and also for food. So um, the panicum brigatum, the switchgrass here, is one that is um, a food source in terms of these um, seed heads are eaten by birds and other wildlife. It's good for cover. As the plant grows, it gets wider and wider, and it's a good place for animals that need to nest and hide. And um, one of the things that's probably most remarkable about this plant is its root system. So particularly if you have an area where erosion mm -hmm. is an issue, the roots of the switchgrass can reach up to 10 feet. Wow. Below the plant. So it's gonna <laughs> soak up a lot of water then? It, it will help with, with um, yes, it will help with keeping water on site and using that water, but also just help hold the soils in place. Getting back to those elements. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. Um, and then this is a Solidago Fireworks, the type of goldenrod that's mm -hmm. pretty popular. It has profuse yellow blooms um, as you go later in the summer and into the fall. And that's another one that's good for um, pollinators and it's good for other types of wildlife that will eat the seeds. And if I remember, remember correctly, you're supposed to buy three or five um, for grouping purposes, an odd number for grouping purposes? Well, a lot of times that is the case with landscape design principles, and if you have enough room to um, put in multiple plants, not just one of a species, um, but start with a couple that you'd like to try right. and group them together, then you're more likely to start attracting whatever type of um, butterfly or moth or other type of um, insect or right. creature that you'd like to see. There are more and there will be more food source for them. So these two plants would be good for me to perhaps buy one or two, put it in my garden just to see where I want it, then I can always transplant them and put them someplace else if I find that, oh yeah, I like that and I want a grouping of, of uh, the switchgrass or the soldago. That's great. You can always try something out and see how it does. And in terms of people having questions about their gardens, you have a couple websites that you would recommend people calling? Um, I would point you towards, um, I think I'd say First of all, I point you towards the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council and the, the eight elements that we were talking about. If you're interested specifically in native plants, there is a wonderful guide available online also, um, one that is free, called the Native Plants for Wildlife Habitat and Conservation Landscaping of the Chesapeake Bay Region, and that's put out by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. So it's actually hard to get in print these days because it's been so popular, but you can just download it for free oh, great. on the internet and it tells you so much information about the plants that are native to this area that it helps you make selections. And tell us about your work. At, you have a couple projects going on at Atkins Arboretum. Well, one of the things that we're working on right now is getting ready for the, the spring new plant sale and um, sourcing plant material from all around the Mid-Atlantic region because we're having over 200 species of plants that are available to choose from. And they're available throughout the growing season and in early fall, second week of September, we have another sale at that time. Um, one of the other things that we're doing on site is called the Native Plant Propagation Initiative and we are working with a core group of volunteers to collect seed and cuttings of plants that are locally native 
and we're propagating those at the Arboretum. So you're doing the legwork for us novices to learn more and more about what which species are the most important ones for us to grow to attract the wildlife that we want to have in our gardens? That's correct. We're really focusing on some of the ones that we'd like to, you know, we think have great value and we'd like to get a little bit more into the horticultural trade. And by doing this type of work right at the Arboretum, it's a wonderful opportunity for not just um, the volunteers who are working with us to learn, but also for others as we amass more plant material, we'll be able to plant those into demonstration gardens and provide a, a learning opportunity in that way as well. Well, Leslie, it's been a pleasure having you here. We hope to have you here again. Thank you. Thanks so much.